Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams, and I'm your host, and we're so excited to have you for another Fireside. We've got some fantastic speakers that I'm so excited to introduce to you in just a few minutes and a very special topic that has has a lot of overarching and, and far-reaching effect, both in our, our personal lives and, and really in every relationship that we have. So I'm excited to share that with you in just a few minutes. But before we get started with our fireside, if you haven't yet, please go to turtle.link slash app and download the Our Turtle House app. It's totally free, available on the iOS and the Google Play Store. And this is the this is the logo right here. And there's so much amazing free content from some of your, some of your favorite speakers like John By the Way, Hank Smith, Meg Johnson, and so many more. So go check that out. And also let us know your ideas of future speakers and topics of people you'd like to hear from because we choose people and we choose topics based on the people that you submit. So go to turtle.link slash share and let us know who you'd love to hear from for these future firesides. With that, let's get things started with tonight's fireside. And before we before I get to the topic, we'll, we'll look at some of the feedback that we've gotten from, from people this last week. First from Sabrina, who says, I absolutely love these firesides. I find peace, comfort, and many times I, I receive answers and the beautiful words of these amazing speakers. Their testimonies are so strong and inspiring. Thank you so much for continuing to do these firesides. Sabrina, thank you so much for tuning in, and we're so glad that you found inspiration and light in these firesides. We love putting them on for you. We also heard from Rachel, who said, these firesides have been fabulous. Rachel, thank you so much for letting, letting us know how you feel, and we're so glad that these firesides have been a blessing to you and your family. Tonight's topic, are you ready? It is strengthening love and relationships. Thank you, Paige, for sending in that idea. It's such an important topic, how to strengthen love and relate in, in our relationships, not just with people that we may be in a relationship with, whether it's friends or a romantic partner, but also with the relationships with, that we have with ourselves, the relationship that we have with ourselves. And so I'm so excited to introduce our speakers tonight. They are our perfect people to talk about this subject and how we can strengthen the relationship that we have with others as well as with ourselves. Our first speaker is a licensed marriage and family therapist with a practice in Provo. She served on the Utah State Marriage and Family Therapy Licensing Board and is an adjunct professor of family life at Brigham Young University, where she teaches classes in marriage preparation and marriage enhancement to a thousand students each semester. She helped develop and then eventually taught the first BYU course dealing with healthy sexuality and marriage. As a relationship and sexuality coach, she provides many free resources at TammyHill.com or on Instagram at Tammy underscore Hill underscore LMFT. Her first book, God Made Girls and Boys, will be available this year or is available this year. She and her husband, Jeff, married 14 years ago, meeting after they both lost their first spouses. Together, they have 12 children and 34 grandchildren. Let's welcome Tammy Hill. Tammy, it's so good to have you back on the fireside. Thank you. It's so fun to be back, Mark. Uh, and, and your book is available now, isn't it? Or yeah. it hasn't come out yet? We got it last week. It's here and it's oh. just so beautiful. I love it. God made girls and boys. I love that. I love that. I'm so excited to check it out. And, and, uh, and I'm glad that it's finally come out. That's so exciting. Me too. Thank you. Thank we'll you. Go ahead and, oh, you're, you're very welcome. We'll go ahead and introduce our next speaker who's a, a professor of family life at Brigham Young University, where he teaches classes in family finance to about 1,500 students each year. His research examines money and family life. He received a PhD in family studies from Utah State and a Master of Organizational Behavior from BYU. He's authored or co-authored seven books and more than 100 scholarly articles and book chapters. He and his wife, Tammy, are blending a family of 12 children and 33 grandchildren and Jeff's study of finances and families has proved providential. Let's welcome Tammy's husband, Jeff Hill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jeff. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here. So good to have you on the fireside and such a cool opportunity to have both of you together. This is so exciting. It is very exciting to, to be together and it's great to be with Tammy. I love it. And, I love and it. there really are 34 grandchildren. We had a baby come two weeks ago. So, oh, <laughs> I, make so sure numbers numbers wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, congratulations. That's so exciting. 34 grandkids. Yeah. We don't want, we don't want to get the, the count wrong. Definitely don't That's want to get right. the count wrong. <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, Jeff, thank you so much. And, and Tammy, again, thank you so much for being here. We'll go ahead and introduce our final speaker who's an LDS relationship and sexuality coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Illinois. 
She has a PhD in counseling psychology. Her teaching and coaching focus on helping, ha- helping Latter-day Saint individuals and couples achieve greater satisfaction and passion in their emotional and sexual relationships. In addition to consultation with couples and individual in person and online, she teaches online relationship and sexuality courses, courses designed to foster self and sexual development and create happier relationships and individuals. Dr. Finlayson Fife also offers many live workshops and retreats for couples and individuals. She's a frequent guest on LDS themed podcasts and writes articles for Latter-day Saint themed blogs and magazines on the subjects of sexuality, relationships, mental health, and faith. Let's welcome Jennifer Finlayson Fife. Jennifer, so good to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here. All the way from Illinois. I love yes, it. Yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, this is going to be a fantastic evening, and so thank you all for, for coming together tonight to, to help us learn more about how we can strengthen uh, relationships both with ourselves and with others and, and increase the level of love and compassion that, that we have in our relationships. So with that, let's start with an opening prayer by Tammy. Okay. Our Father in Heaven, we are very grateful for the opportunity we have to come together this evening and talk more about principles of the gospel in relation to um, ourselves and to others. We're very grateful for the opportunity that we can feel of thy spirit and ask that it might be here with us as we speak tonight. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tammy. Mm -hmm. We'll have you and Jen go backstage for a few minutes and start things off with Jeff. So tonight, I, I didn't mention, tonight's focus is not just on strengthening love and relationships, but it's also just talking more about some of the, the biggest the biggest struggles that people have with, with love and relationships and how we can repair those things. And so just going to start things off by by talking about money, because money and finances is is one of the biggest struggles that people have in relationships. Is that right, Jeff? That is correct. Uh, if you can get money right, you're halfway there in a relationship. Oh man, that's <laughs> that's a pretty big that's a pretty big jump. Halfway halfway there just by getting your money right. I love that. <laughs> well, I'm well, so excited a, to hear what you have. It's an expansive view of money. I mean, I love uh, it. I love it. Represents. Totally, totally. Well, I'm so excited to hear what you have to to share with us on on the topic of finances tonight. So go ahead and take it away, my friend. That's great. That's great. Uh, well. The topic that I wrote on uh, that I'm going to talk about this evening is money matters in marriage, but it could have to do with relationships as well. It certainly does. Um, I teach at BYU and and, uh, Tammy and I love teaching. We love that uh, that COVID is over and that we'll be able to teach with full classrooms again, teach about 1,500 students a year. And at the beginning of every class, I say three things. And these three things I'd like to briefly share with you right now. The first is life is hard, but you can do hard things. In fact, managing your money well within marriage is very difficult, but you can do it. In fact, there is nothing too hard. You can do anything that the Lord wants you to do if if he is your partner. The second thing is when life doesn't go as planned, don't get frustrated and make the best of it. Life hardly ever goes as planned. And if you go around being frustrated when things don't work out, you'll just go around being frustrated. And so I think that it's very important to develop the virtue of patience with yourself and with others. And the third is T, 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 things take time. Everything takes time, and especially in financial matters, uh, you have to give yourself some space. Okay, the next uh, slide has a summary that, that if you remember nothing else, this one quote will, will summarize it all. Uh, Elder Robert D. Hale said, we must practice the principles of provident living, joyfully living within our means being content with what we have, avoiding excessive debt, and diligently saving and preparing for rainy day emergencies. Uh, Following those principles, anyone will be successful in marriage, but not uh, will marriage end with finances. Um, uh, I study this area and it's very important. I'd like to illustrate 
in marital relationships, uh, up to 90% of those who divorce are having problems with their finances. Financial conflict is one of the most difficult things in marriages and in relationships. And I'd like to just illustrate this with a story. Uh, in marriage, there's always a spender and a saver. And in my first marriage with uh, Juanita, before before she passed away, I was definitely the spender and she was the saver. She was the most frugal person I knew. Um, but sometimes this con uh, caused conflict. When I was getting my PhD, I took my son to a football game. Uh, when I came back, uh, Juanita asked him, how was the game with dad? And he said, it was the best day ever. Dad bought me nachos and a drink and a hot dog. It was so fantastic. I got to get whatever I wanted. And then Juanita gave me that look. And she said, Jeff, I could have fed our family for a week on the money you wasted at that game. And I said to her, I can do whatever I want with my son. What's a game without getting some treats? Well, we had a big argument about that. It was distressing. And frankly, in marriage, there are many opportunities for conflict. Um, there's always a saver and a spender, and this is a difficult thing to negotiate. So let's go to the, the next slide here. Uh, there are two key goals for money, uh, for making money matter in marriage. The first is stewardship, and as I tell my class, with money, it's not about get making the most money. It's about becoming a wise steward of our material resources in such a way that you, your spouse, and your family gain eternal life. Um, it's, a, it's not important how much money you make or to get the greatest return on your investment. It is important that you have sufficient resources for your needs. Once that is met, you can meet this goal of stewardship. And then in relationships, particularly marriage, trust is the second goal. And basically, as equal partners, if a couple will exhibit integrity, transparency, and honesty in money matters, they can claim joy. Let's go to the next slide. So we're going to talk about each of these very briefly and then share some tips uh, for you as you manage your money for equal partnership, integrity, transparency, and honesty. Let's first look at uh, equal partnership. Next slide. Uh, we just completed a study on equal partnership in, in marriage. Uh, and we found some very clear findings. Next slide. Equal partnership is essential to marital trust in money matters. When both spouses are involved in financial decisions and processes, both partners feel more empowered. They have greater relationship quality and stability. Um, in uh, the press article that was written about this, uh, they quoted me, and what I say, I believe. Of course, I said it. <laughs> Relationships that thrive are based in trust. So when you relinquish control over something that is near and dear to you, like money, that you work so hard to earn, regardless of gender, and say, this is ours, and we are going to have equal access to it, that shows trust. A very important principle in money management than in marriage is equal partnership, that in any way you can think of, each partner has equal access to the financial resources in marriage. Next slide. Uh, the second principle is integrity. And an integrity means to align the financial stewardship with values that are shared by the couple. I want you to listen carefully here just for a moment in this related to integrity. When you exchange money for money you have for things that you value most, you will claim joy. It's true, it's a true principle. However, when you fritter away money, 
you have for things you value less or don't value, you'll claim frustration. And that frustration will impact your marriage. And number three, when you spend money you don't have, go into debt for things you don't need, you're not very smart. In fact, I'd say you're just plain dumb. The counsel that we have over and over again is to avoid debt like the plague. Next slide. Uh, just as an example, Tammy and I practice integrity when we used our money to go to Austria. Was that trip cheap? No, it cost thousands of dollars. But Tammy and I value beautiful places, nature, the out of doors. We value being experienced in other cultures. We value being together alone. This trip fulfilled all of those values. And so with this trip, we claimed great joy. There wasn't even a second thought about the cost of the trip because we had the money and it, we aligned those with our, uh, with our values. Next slide. The third principle is financial transparency, and that equals marital trust. The research is clear. Couples that hold all major financial assets in common, they have joint checking accounts, joint savings accounts, both of their names are on the house, cars, and other major assets, have better marriages. Also, couples that review their expenditures frequently, at least weekly, um, also have, and this is an example of trust, and that trust leads to uh, great joy in marriage. Uh, Tammy and I, every week, almost without fail, on Sunday afternoon, we go through every transaction of the week. We're totally transparent, and this leads us to trust each other more. Uh, next slide. The final uh, way for trust is financial honesty. It's very important not to hide significant assets and debts from each other and to not hide spending, except maybe for presents to each other. Uh, hiding significant debts and spending is called financial infidelity, and the research is clear. The outcomes for financial infidelity are almost as negative as the outcomes for sexual infidelity. We need to be open and honest. We need to live within the budget that we've agreed on and have the agreement of our spouse before making major financial decisions. Okay, next slide. So I hope you'll remember these four components. And in the last uh, five minutes that I have, I want to just share a couple of tips uh, related to finances very briefly. The first tip is to consider mad money. Mad money is actually the solution that Juanita and I had for the argument that we had. We decided that for incidental spending, each spouse could have some money of their own each month that was off budget, that the spouse could use for whatever they wanted that was legal and moral. And uh, this actually is a secret that can resolve, I think, the majority of arguments if each spouse has a little money that they just spend on their own. The second tip is related to following the HALT principle. That is to be very careful before making a purchase or talking about money with your spouse if you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. There's actually a lot of research on this. Before dealing with finances, either verbally with your spouse or making purchases, maybe have a good meal. Do something so that you're self-calmed. Uh, do something so that you feel connected and that you're rested and you'll have a lot more success. The next tip is related to uh, just saying, don't do dumb things with your money. <laughs> There's a saying, if it sounds too good to be true, then it usually it is, is. For some reason, members of the church often make poor financial decisions, invest lots of money in bogus schemes. And if you haven't had this experience already, 
someone is bound to approach you at church with some great financial deal. This is such a problem in the church that the first presidency a few years ago said, those who use relationships of trust to promote risky or even fraudulent bis, uh, investments and business schemes, uh, as members of the search, we, church, we need to avoid those things. The next financial tip is to understand opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is simply the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. One of the dumbest things I've ever heard is, well, I can afford it, so why don't I just buy it? That is so dumb. There's many things you can afford that you should not buy. Be aware and beware of opportunity costs, not only in dollars and cents, but in the relationship. Just a couple more tips. Uh, the one is the sleep on it rule, which attacks the halt principle. Before you buy a car or a major purpose, uh, purchase, uh, talk about it with your spouse over dinner. Come to a tentative decision, pray about it together. Cuddle together and get a good night's sleep. Pray about it in the morning and then make your final decision. If you follow the sleep on it principle, you will rarely, if ever, make a major financial blunder. Next slide. Um, the final tip that I have is realize money you spend on your marriage can be considered an investment. I recommend that couples in their budget have a, a, a date fund, a budget for weekly dates, and frequent overnight getaways as much as you can, especially without the children. Also, the right gifts can be a great uh, blessing. Remember birthdays and anniversaries and know what your spouse would like, not what you would like when you do a gift. And don't be afraid to save and sacrifice and spend on something that's nice for your spouse. So in conclusion, um, I encourage you to... Use money as a symbol of trust and love in your relationships. Remember, this trust is developed as you have equal partnership, as you exhibit integrity, transparency, and honesty. Think of ways that you can do more of that. And I will conclude just bearing my testimony that everything belongs to the Lord. We are stewards of material resources. And as we are wise stewards of those resources, God will bless us so that we can meet the needs. We can meet the needs of ourselves, of our spouses, our marriages, and our families. Um, it's not about the money. It's about using and consecrating our resources to the glory of God. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Jeff, I loved, there's a few things that really stood out to me. I love how you talked about that, that whether it's a date or other, other money that you're spending together as a couple, that it, it could actually be an investment in your relationship. And like you and Tammy have, have invested your relationship in travel and other experiences. And I think that that's so powerful. And Something else that you said reminded me of my mission. But one of our mission models was DDDT, don't do dumb things. And, uh, <laughs> I, like and I love exactly, you, you, you did DDDTWT, don't do dumb things with, oh no, with DDDTWM with money. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. I love it. Just keep it simple. Just keep it simple. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing those principles today. That was fantastic. <laughs> it would be so fun to be able to say that to a couple in session. Don't be so dumb. <laughs> you can't. You can't do that. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You didn't mince your words there. You went right. <laughs> but I also really appreciated that idea because I think a lot of times we think, oh, if we're if we're using this stewardship wisely, we're only going to spend it on the most bare bones needs and not really appreciating how much investing in experiences and experiences in your partnership and with your children 
is really critical to those values and using that stewardship wisely. So I think sometimes we think if we're spiritual or good, we're just overly dutiful without investing in joyful experience mm -hmm. and things that replenish and rejuvenate us as so important mm -hmm. to our spiritual well-being, our marital well-being. So I really love, love that idea. Thank you. I love that. Mm -hmm. Rejuvenate and replenish your relationship. That's, that's so important. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being on the fireside tonight and for sharing such an important so, such important things about an important topic about finances. Cause like you said, you know, if you, if you get your finances right in your relationship, whether it's with yourself or with, with your spouse or your partner, then you're halfway there. And that's, that's you. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us tonight. We'll go ahead and move to our next speaker of the evening. Your wonderful wife, Tammy, Tammy, so good to have you back on, a, on our fireside tonight. And you've got another one of the biggest the biggest uh, frustrations or, or sticking points that people have in your relationship that you're going to share with us today. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Device usage. Um, so many couples, so many individuals um, using their devices to bond with rather than each other. I, I'm sure you've seen the, uh, the, this was a few years ago, but I'm sure you've seen the picture where an artist took pictures of couples and then removed the cell phone mm -hmm. from their hands and, you know, they're faced away from each other and just looking like this or whatever. And that was a huge mm -hmm. realization to me. I didn't realize that device usage, which was such a big thing until I saw that. I was like, Oh man, that's, yeah, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> it's very stark. Those, those images actually were haunting to me, but yes, I oh, agree. Oh man. Well, I'm so excited to hear what you have to share with us tonight. Go ahead and take it away. All right. Thanks, Mark. So tonight I get to talk a little bit about device usage and how it's impacting you as an individual and how it might be impacting your relationships with others as well. So Wit, if you wanna turn on my slides, that would be great. As I start every semester or if I start working with couples in therapy, often I go to um, this one point, and I'll go there first tonight too, and kind of wrap up with this as well. And that is what is your why? Your why is like the bullseye on a target. It's right there in the middle. It's what is, you're about. It's what you're choosing to live for, who you want to be known as. Um, and when we are living what we believe we are, who we believe we are, how we want to be, I call that living in alignment. And when we're living aligned, we are living our whys. I happen to host the Live Your Why podcast where often I'll have guests come on. I both had Jennifer and Jeff actually talking a little bit about what their whys are. And today I wanna just have you think a little bit about your why in regards to your phone usage. I put on um, this slide some pictures of different um, families and children um, sitting there looking and uh, how they're interacting with their phones, just for something to think about. As we begin, I want to remind you that when we are dead, when we are done, what we take with us are first our knowledge, the things that we gain um, and, and pressure ourselves to learn, and two, our relationships with others. So here we go. All right, Whit. So in, uh, since the year 2000, 92% um, of the divorces in the United States include within the divorce um, decree that cell phone or other technology, they have evidence that that led to some type of infidelity. And I think, and I know from the research, that the, the simplest way that it feels like you're not connecting is through a new term called fubbing, which is basically phone cells snubbing. Um, it's when you are engrossed with your phone more than you're engrossed with it and engaging in the people who are around you. And it will be damaging your relationships. Anytime we sit down with someone and we have our phone with us and we have it between us, or even if it's just sitting on the table next to us, um, studies show that we're not really fully present with the people we're with because our minds are focused on, oh, I might get a, a message. I might have a notification come up. And if so, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. So fubbing particularly is getting in the middle of relationships. 
Okay. Several years ago, Jeff and I took a lovely trip to Washington, D.C., and my highlight of that trip was going to Mount Vernon, um, the home of George and Martha Washington. I just loved my time there. Their home, their mansion was on the Potomac River. It was so scenic. And uh, next to Mount Vernon, there was this restaurant that was done all in colonial time. People were dressed as the colonists would have been dressed and they were serving food that would have been served back in the day. And I was just thinking this was so romantic and so I just loved learning about these wonderful people and being kind of back in that time frame. As we sat to order our meal, I observed around the restaurant and by and large, at every table, at least one person was engaged in a phone. There was one family that was there where one person of the five of them did not have a phone. Everyone else was on their phones. And closest to where Jeff and I were sitting was a couple. And I honestly don't think they talked to one another the entire time they ate their meal. Each of them were on their phone, engaging with their phones more than one another. And as I sat there, I was engrossed in this situation. And I truly just felt sorrowful in my heart for so many missed opportunities um, as people were artificially connecting in a companionship to their devices rather than to one another. So technology is a lousy substitute for real connection and for truly bonding with other people. Sue Johnson is, uh, Dr. Sue Johnson is the founder of Emotionally Focused Therapy, Couples Therapy, and she uses this phrase that I have on that first bullet point as selfishness. I love the way she writes that with the cell, C-E-L-L, -L, um, there. But in when we are engaged in our phones, we're only thinking about ourselves. We're not worried about anything else going on around us. We're here with ourselves. That is not connection. It creates an illusion of being connected. We might be constantly, continually in contact with people, but we are not being emotionally bonded to those people. It's an emotional distraction. Um, fewer people today um, have the ability to collaborate and work together in team settings because of cell phones and device usage. Um, the working, because they found that working with people is a lot more challenging than working with my computer or working with my phone. Um, people are relationships. One another is with people that we have relationships and what happens often, maybe we're in a game on our phone and we lose so or we're losing even and we just exit out and start over again. And I found so many young couples coming into therapy having such a difficult time knowing how to emotionally connect. And I believe some of the reason is because of phone usage, that when things get hard on your game or if things are challenging wherever you are, you can self-soothe with your telephones rather than learning appropriate coping mechanisms to bless your own life and to bless the lives of people that you engage with. All right, well. So I thought this was an interesting uh, percentages. Dr. John Gottman is one of the leading researchers on marriage in the world. And he's found that 86% of adult American, American adults continuously check their devices for social media updates, emails, and text messages. He also, through his research, has found that successfully married couples turn toward each other 86% of the time, accepting bids for connection. So I thought those 86% were interesting that they were the same number. Which 86% aligns with your why? As you think about what you want to accomplish in your time and mortality, as you consider who you want to become while you're here, which of those 86% align with who you really want to be? Okay. 
So I challenge you, each one of us, to make a, a technology plan for ourselves because the most important relationship we have is the one that we have with ourselves, who we are. And to do that, there's a few things to remember. First of all, remember your why. Line up your uh, what you choose for your screensaver with your why. My screensaver happens to be a picture of my husband, Jeff, and he is important to me. He's one of the most important things to me. Put one of the most important things to you as your screensaver as a way to remember what it is you're really about. One thing that can really help is to decide how much time you're going to spend on your phone before you start getting on your phone. How much time do you have? If you have 15 minutes, set your alarm on your phone and be there for 15 minutes. But intentionally choose how much time you're going to spend. Then when you turn on your device, if you can't remember what it is you're, in, you're doing, what you're intending to do with your device, turn it off. Stop. Rethink, what is it that I'm doing? And as I get older, I do this more and more. I pick up my phone, I think, what was I going to do? I know it was important. But think about what it is you were, your, your intentions are, and then go and do what it is you're intending to do. And I would really encourage all of us to limit the use of our technology when we have a lot of big emotions, when we're really tired or uh, extremely stressed. During those times, often people will uh, get into areas on the web where they really shouldn't be. So don't self-regulate emotionally with your devices. Next, I want to talk a little bit about how to make a plan for technology within your marriage. And this is something that I'm doing more and more with couples today. And just a few things I want to point out is that this has to be a conversation that you're both willing to have. So talk with your spouse. If something is bothering you, bring it up to your spouse and create a time and a space where you can sit down and talk about this without distraction. Discuss together why you think it's a good idea to have a plan for your technology. What is it you're feeling? Are you feeling kind of abandoned when your partner's on their phone? What is it you're thinking? Do you think that this person could be helping more or at least talking to you a little more while, while you're in their presence? Focus on what you're thinking and what it is you're feeling. Then so importantly, as Jeff mentioned in his talk, we must be equal partners and have equal voice in deciding together how we're going to uh, implement the plan that we decide to use. And finally, I want you to remember that often it's in the unstructured moments of life that relationships grow. In those fleeting moments that we have from time to time, when we look at one another, when we start talking with each other, or we simply reach out and touch one another, often it is in those um, times when we're not engaged in anything that a relationship can move to a deeper level. Finally, I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about something that the older I get um, and the more people that I have who are so important to me in my life, I really have come to believe that our gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is about loving relationships. It's all about how are we relating and connecting with each other. When a baby comes to the earth, the primary need it has other than food is to be able to be nurtured and loved. As adults, we have those same needs. We need to be loved and connected with someone. So I kind of have put some of my thoughts in our Heavenly Parents plan for us versus the adversaries plan for us when in regards to relationships. First of all, I believe our Heavenly Parents want us to have healthy relationships with one another. And I think the adversary wants to be really destructive of relationships. I often see the adversary creeping between couples, trying to make them see how many differences they have rather than how many commonalities they actually share. Um, I believe our heavenly parents want us to love and serve one another with charity. And I believe in the adversary's view, we are encouraged to be jealous, to be competitive, maybe critical in our judgments without 
charity for one another is all about me being best. I think a lot of times when we go over to this side of the, the slide, um, our heavenly parents have an eternal progression in mind for each of us. Our progression, we progress in mortality, we progress pre-mortally, and we're going to continue to continually progress after this life is over. And we have that possibility because of the atonement of our Savior. On the other hand, their progression isn't so much a big deal to this to Satan's plan. I think a lot of what is the lies that he tells us is that we have to be perfect. That if we're not doing it exactly right, we might as well give up. I think the idea of perfectionism destroys faith in yourself and it destroys faith in your relationships. And I think it often will lead you to, to give up on your faith in Jesus Christ himself. And finally, eternal love and marriage that can be forever with two committed people working together to live true principles. That is our heavenly parents' plan for us here in mortality. That is the role of family life. Whereas, again, in the plan of the adversary, it is selfishness. It's where relationships, when they become personally um, inconvenient to one or both partners, it's okay to just step aside and not invest any longer. I want you all to know of my testimony of um, the idea that our gospel is relational. It is relationship-centered. We are here to help one another get back to heaven. Pre-mortally, in the book of Revelation, Joseph Smith translation, it talks about what we did to overcome Satan pre-mortally in one verse in chapter 12. It says three things, that we had faith in the Lamb. If you think about it, this is long before the Savior was conceived immaculately. It's before we even saw the earth created. We had faith that he would come and do what he said he was going to do. Second, we encouraged one another through the voice of our testimonies. We must nurture and strengthen one another with our faith in Jesus Christ. And third, we primordially overcame Satan by being willing to sacrifice our own selves if necessary. I know that part of the important part of that to me is the essentialness that we have in helping one another, in putting our phones away, communicating, connecting, and loving. I am thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. I know he lives. I love him and I long to return to him and be with our heavenly parents again and pray that this will be something that will be my focus and my why throughout my time in mortality. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Tammy, that was that was wonderful. And I I I mean, just like we talked about at the beginning of your talk, you know, that picture where you can kind of see how how impactful device usage can be on relationships as you describe different things. I, I it made me realize how much we do use even as individuals, we use devices as a way to to tune out for a minute or to self-soothe or just to get away from the situation. I it as you were talking, it made me think about times where I'm like, I just need to not think for a second, even when I'm around friends and people, you know, and I'm, what do I do? I pull out my phone and start scrolling social media and stuff like that. And it's like, and, and I totally agree that, that some of the best parts of relationships, the best memories that I have are mm -hmm. things that you can't plan. It's that the little moments that happen in between that you're totally oblivious to if, if that's where you, if you're on your phone instead of in the moment. So thank you so much for sharing that. That was fantastic. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. And I agree 100% with you. We all have the tendency to pick it up to self-soothe or spend some time. And um, preparing this this talk for today has given me more, um, I guess, kind of a reality check that I should practice what I preach a little better. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, that. I think it's, I'd like the, you know, remembering your why and being deliberate because it's a tool and it can certainly bless our lives, but it oh. also is designed to hijack our attention and hijack our loyalty in a way. And 
And so because it's so good at lighting up and telling you there's some attention or some validation waiting for you there, mm -hmm. <laughs> it can be very easy to let it run your life. And it's just, yeah. you know, so I really like that deliberateness and the idea of, of what your screensaver is. I was like, I didn't even remember what mine was. And it's of my <laughs> golden retriever, which is very cute and lovely, but <laughs> I think it should be something a little more inspiring like my family, yeah. <laughs> And I, I I really like her screensaver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I I just wanted to, I wanted to say that Tammy does practice what she preaches, uh, and I'd like to just give a little example of a couple coming together uh, for uh, a kind of a, a plan to deal with device usage. When Tammy started to get so successful on Instagram, uh, you know her work is on the phone dealing with that Instagram. And I've kind of felt threatened and jealous of her. It helped that her screensaver was me, but I was still uh, a little bit. And and I'm not really that forthcoming, but she said, well, we just need to talk about it. And so we kind of sat down and talked about it and, and set up a couple of things like, um, we, we agreed that when I came in and she was on her phone, whatever she was doing, she put the phone down, look up, and I could have 30 seconds of her <laughs> full, total attention. And and then she would let me know what she was doing. And she would say, well, I'll be here about 45 minutes or 15 more minutes, and then we can talk about it. But just that 30 seconds of, of disengaging from the phone made me feel like I was most important, not uh, not what she, not even her work that's very important. She wasn't scrolling around, she was doing her work. Uh, and then the other thing that she said that is so wonderful is the boundary around going to bed. And uh, what mm. she does and what uh, is she'll put her phone on the charger in another room when it's time to go to bed. So we know that we have that time together that uh, the phone's not in between us. So I just wanted to share, Tammy does practice what she preaches. I love that, that's awesome, that's awesome. Well, Tammy, thank you again for being on the fireside tonight and sharing such so, some really practical tools and ways that we can, we can work through device usage problems in our relationships and be more present for the people that we care about most. So thank you so much. Thank you. We'll finish things up with our final speaker of the evening, Jennifer. Thank you again for being on the fireside. This is this is a pleasure and honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And yeah. uh, and I believe that uh, that your topic tonight is we've we've talked about money, we've talked about the using devices, and and so you're diving more into about into intimacy and the mm -hmm. way that we can build relationships and strengthen our relationships that way. Yeah. And, you know, intimacy challenges are very much fundamental to difficulties in marriage. And this is the work I do, helping couples around their emotional and sexual intimacy. And tonight I'm going to talk about intimacy a little bit broadly. Of course, it relates to sexual intimacy, which is this ability to know another and to be known. And, mm -hmm. you know, as I'll talk about, this is often way more challenging than we sometimes acknowledge how challenging totally. intimacy really is. And it's well, enough. and it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary when you're scary. when you're in a friendship or relationship with somebody, and and for for them to see you as you know as with you no are. walls and you know as who you are. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That it, it can be really scary. So I'm excited to hear what you have to share. Let's go ahead and take it Great. away. Great, thank you. So um, yeah, so almost all of us would profess that we what we desire is greater intimacy in our lives. And that is to say, whether we're married or single, that we want to be known and loved. We want to be known and valued. And, you know, it's very much human nature to want to belong and to have rich relationships. We don't want to live our lives feeling misunderstood or in isolation or lonely. Um, and indeed, loneliness is painful. And it's bad for our mental health. It's even bad for our physical health. In fact, there's research that shows that being extremely lonely has a similar effect on your physical health as smoking does. So 
so often, as I mentioned earlier, that divorce is linked to these challenges around emotional and sexual isolation or feeling misunderstood by your spouse. So many people that come in to work with me, they're, they're presenting issue is this feeling of isolation and the feeling of being misunderstood. Sometimes they talk about it as communication problems, but as I'll be speaking about, this is about a difficulty with really knowing and being known and tolerating the, what that process creates in us. So as true as it is, you know, that we want to be uh, understood, we want to belong, we want to be valued, we are in fact much less interested in actual intimacy than I think many of us realize. Because while we want to be accepted, very few of us truly want to be known. You think about it, that's why social media is so compelling is it's a, the perfect presentation of ourselves that we can really curate how we're seen. And it's very tempting to want to present to the world a picture of ourselves that is flawless or at least a cut above the human condition in some way. We have this fantasy that if we are that, then we will be lovable. So, you know, it's human nature to want our spouse, our friends, our family to value us, to see our talents and gifts and to acknowledge the laudatory aspects of us. But in reality, we also want them to go blind to or not see the underdeveloped parts of us or the uglier parts of us. We want them to look past our limitations and our self-deceptions. In fact, we often confuse this with love, right? In the name of love, we will pressure those around us to not see us. If you love me, pretend with me that I'm kinder or less selfish than I really am, right? If you love me, take care of me and let me get away with not growing into a person who takes full responsibility for her life. Right. If you love me, do what makes me comfortable. I don't want to know you, right? at least not the parts I don't want to deal with, or see more about who I am through your eyes. That's the trouble with marriage. Okay, That's the trouble with this, an honest spouse is you start seeing yourself more through their eyes, and this is uncomfortable. We often don't want it, and what we can do is instead of deal with what they see about us, we will try to shoot the messenger, you know, say, you don't understand me. You're not being fair. When in fact, it's a way to dodge what we might be able to understand about ourselves by being loved and known by them. Of course, it's understandable why so many of us want a kind of love that validates us, that accepts us just as we are. We want the comfort of it. We want the parental love or the unconditional acceptance that we once knew as a very young child. But in grown-up relationships, this is a fantasy that we can do things the way we currently are comfortable and find full approval by everyone. <laughs> it's just not how life works. And I think a lot of us imagine that this is what we need in order to feel good about ourselves, that we can convince those around us that we are sufficient. Um, in reality, this is very much a trap when we try to do this. When we're trying to keep everyone happy with us, it's very difficult to live authentically, to live honestly, and to live your why, to, to cite Tammy's idea, that if we are so compelled by keeping other people thinking we're legitimate in their eyes, we're in fact trapped by them. What many of us imagine when we get married is that if we have found the ideal marriage partner, the right person for us, that they will provide that kind of unconditional acceptance, that ongoing IV drip of validation for eternity. That's what most of us secretly want <laughs> when we decide to get married. Of course, this is not what we get, and this can be challenging, right? The, the good, as good as this might feel, this fantasy, this hope that we will have someone who will approve of us fully, even in our flawed state, there are two problems with this conception of love. If we're truly known because someone only, if we aren't truly known because someone only sees the good parts, we still don't have intimacy, right? And therefore we still feel lonely. Because if you believe your approval is based on a farce, on pretense, then you're 
you, you still are not fully loved and accepted. They love you because they don't fully see you is what you may imagine. And as good as that validation may feel, you know you are still not free, free to be yourself, free to be known, free to be valued. And so we usually feel we must continue to put on a show, hide, pretend, live dishonestly to keep the approval we need and desire in place. We had this lovely babysitter years ago who was just incredibly kind. She always said the most affirming things about my children, how wonderful they were, how kind they were, et cetera, et cetera. One day my daughter said to me, Joanna is so nice, mom, but I kind of hate having her babysit. <laughs> and I was really surprised. I was like, you're kidding, why? She says, because I feel so much pressure to not disappoint her. I have to pretend that I'm kind all the time <laughs> and it gets exhausting. <laughs> so while I wasn't sure that this was such a bad thing, <laughs> she says, it's a little bit like having Jesus babysit is what she said. <laughs> She said that while it wasn't entirely a bad thing in some ways to have her be aware of her behavior, she made a valid point that it can feel, in fact, isolating and lonely if you feel like you have to pretend to keep, some, to keep another person's approval. And so, you know, again, as good as that validation may feel, we're not really free. If you're going to have an intimate relationship, you have to let yourself be knowable. And to be knowable, you have to be willing to be honest. And a lot of us want connection and a feeling of closeness, but we fear the fundamental requirements for real closeness, which is honesty. Being honest is very courageous behavior. If we need other people's approval to feel good about ourselves, it's very difficult to show others who we really are. Being honest is exposing and you sacrifice control over how you're seen. And for this reason, it's very uncomfortable. That is to say, if we are honest, we potentially sacrifice the approval we want. And that is in two ways. We sacrifice both the approval of others, right? As they may disapprove of what we say, honestly think, believe or do, and importantly, we may even sacrifice our own approval, which I think is a very important piece of this. This is not just about your relationship to others. It's also your relationship to yourself. It's often not just the deception of others that keeps us in isolation, but the deception of ourselves that keeps us in isolation. When we lie to ourselves, we compromise our peace of mind. We're a house divided against itself. We can't be settled in our own skin. And I don't think I can overstate how important this is, right? It's, it, we want to have true confidence. We want to be at peace with ourselves. And often we are in these kinds of contradictions of meaning and contradictions between what we believe is good and what we do that creates division and anxiety within us. Um, so it's very easy to lie to ourselves, right? I mean, a lot of times people talk about uh, natural man being about sexuality. But I think natural man is this tendency to self-deceive, that we want to tell ourselves stories that justify our current understanding and our current choices. We want to tell ourselves stories that obscure what's real for the sake of what's comfortable or familiar to us. And we don't like the insecurity that confronting what is, is true seemingly inflicts upon us. So to be honest, to be intimate, right, is to tolerate dealing with what is true about ourselves and about our relationships. It pushes us into growth because we can't tell ourselves a story that justifies us or comforts us. Is it any wonder that honesty is an act of faith? that truth is so integrally connected to faith because to live honestly is an act of faith. It's an act of courage to align ourselves with what is true and to tolerate the discomfort and the uncertainty that will follow from that. Right? So if you come into an understanding, like I have seen myself as being more fair than I really am. Or I remember a conversation with my spouse once where I was just completely convinced that, 
he was deluded and I had the right view. <laughs> and I would have I would have put good money on this position. I, I was very confident in my in the rightness of my position. But I I, I said, you know, I, the, the Stephen Covey idea came into my head. Seek first to understand, then be understood. So I was like, you know, go ahead, give me your impaired view. <laughs> and then we'll get on to me being understood. And he explained how he saw what I was doing and how that was impacting him and why he thought it was unfair. And all of a sudden it just blew up my view. I mean, because I could see it and I knew he was right and it was a blind spot in me. And the tempting thing was to basically find the, you know, the limitations in what he had just said or come up with excuses for why it was justified that I had said or done what I was doing and to try and obliterate his view so I could keep doing it the way I was doing it. That's, that's intimacy. And instead it was, okay, he's right. I need to see what I'm doing and that it's not as good or virtuous or fair as I was imagining. And so it means stepping into a different self-conception. It's tolerating the exposure in that moment that I'm not everything I thought, right? And I'm being unkind. And to let yourself, let the truth lead you into more development, to grow into a better, kinder person, a person who's got a better roadmap of what's true in life and about the people she loves and about herself, right? So often we profess to love the truth, but in reality, we do our very best to avoid it, okay? Because living truthfully is highly connected to growth or self-expansion. How often have you punished a spouse or friend for telling you what they see you doing? How often have we made someone feel bad for showing us a part of ourselves that we don't want to see? How often have you stepped away from a truth that you were afraid of? We sometimes talk about intimacy like it's a warm, fuzzy reality of human experience. And there's nothing wrong with validation and it feels wonderful, especially when it's, excuse me, especially when it's absolutely linked to something that is true, it feels wonderful. But the truth is that intimacy is hard. It is not for the faint of heart. Intimacy punctures any picture of perfection we may desire. It punctures any fantasy that we might somehow rise above our human condition. It punctures any attempt we may be involved in to elevate ourselves above others, or at least make others think we are above them. Of course, as challenging as it is to be honest and live truthfully, it's much more difficult in my experience, ultimately to live dishonestly. It costs us tremendously to live our lives in contradiction. It costs us peace of mind and honest confidence to live our lives, trying to paint pictures of ourselves that we know are not true. That attempt always isolates us from others and from ourselves. It isolates us from God. It undermines our development. It undermines our peace. It also costs other people because it gives them the false idea that there are people that are above the limitations of the human experience. It drives others into hiding, not just ourselves. And it's a very unkind thing to do to ourselves or other children of God. Christianity, the gospel, is very much a theology of love, right? Just as Tammy was talking about, a theology of intimacy. Christ taught us that love is the most important commandment, that it is the objective of faith. Love in relationship is the path to know wisdom. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 12 speaks of, then shall I know even as I am known. He speaks of the intimacy that is fundamental to our spirituality and fundamental to our spiritual development. That it is in knowing and being known to one another and knowing and being known by God that we come to know what is true, right? It's in relationship that truth reveals itself. It is in seeing who we are and being seen that we can live more faithfully, more truthfully, and also move out of our isolation, isolation that's based in fear, not in courage. This is the path to honest self-acceptance. It's the path into our honest development and expansion of our capacity, right? Because, you know, in that moment where my husband showed me a view of myself that punctured my pretense, punctured my 
what I wanted to have be true. It was a path now to step into being better, to being kinder, to being more fair. So as uncomfortable as it was, it actually expands your capacity if you will grow into it. So it, it facilitates your honest development and expansion of your capacity, which is different than fear-driven contempt of self and fear-driven attempts to present a perfectionistic view. Right. We often confuse perfectionism and flawlessness, which I think is fear based with love based evolution, which is developmental and honesty based and 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 um, facilitated by the desire to love better. So to do this, to live honestly, we must sacrifice ego. We have to sacrifice control over how we are seen. We must sacrifice certainty and sacrifice our fantasy of being able to uh, manipulate or control how others perceive us. But if we have faith to live more honestly and to let ourselves be known, we find our strength. We find an honest self-acceptance. We find more ability to accept the love we are offered. And in reality, when we let go of the shackles of pretense, we find our freedom. My favorite scripture has always been, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's simple, but profound. When we live honestly, when we live intimately, we sacrifice image and pretense, but we find solid ground. We find a solid foundation. When we live honestly, we're able to make choices and create a life based on what is real. We are able to find peace with ourselves and find real friendship we're able to find peace with God. So to live honestly is to find freedom, to find the ability to be flawed and in development, but truly free from anxiety of self-rejection and fear. Sacrificing approval for what is true makes you more solid, makes you wiser, and it also makes you more able to love others. This is why I often say that marriage is a divine institution because we promise God to love another and to know them and to let them know us. And this pressures us in ways that we may be unprepared for. Letting someone in on who you are and aren't yet shines a light on the dark places, the unseen places, in a way that helps us become more capable of love, more capable of knowing and being known. It's a sobering process, but a precious one. To create an honest marriage, to create an honest friendship, is to create, to create a home, right? It's the only way one can truly create a place of peace and refuge, whether that's within yourself or within an intimate partnership. It's a way of creating a refuge from a world that can be harsh. And the work I do working with couples in creating more intimate relationships, I've come to have a profound testimony of how confronting what is true takes tremendous faith, but pays off in our development and in our greater peace and in our greater, uh, deeper relationships. To witness that moral courage of a lot of people in challenging situations is a privilege. It's my hope that you will commit today to speak and live with greater honesty in relationship to yourself and in relationship to those you love. To speak what you know to be true, to align your behavior with what you know to be true, and to live up to your own integrity. This is salvation in an uncertain and conditional world. This is the way to find solid ground even though it takes tremendous courage to let go of the false gods that tempt you away from it. May you exercise your faith in a God who sees you in this process, who loves you and believes in your ability to align yourself with truth. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jennifer, that was fantastic. I loved especially how you talked about how it made me think of the, I think it's called radical acceptance where you have to be honest with yourself about who you are and who you're not and yeah. that, so that you can move forward, whether it's in relationships or with yourself. And I loved that it's that it, you can't, with that in mind, you can't use stories to justify yes. what you mm -hmm. are or what you aren't. And yes. I think that's so powerful. That was, that really stood out to me. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Very powerful, Jennifer. Just loved it. I, I have to say I can relate to your daughter and your babysitter because 
I think Jeff is practically perfect, and I absolutely <laughs> hate it. I hate it. <laughs> because I'm so not perfect. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, no, uh, Tammy, you are not perfect. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I know you, and I love you as you are. <laughs> I um, I loved what you had to say, and it, it really spoke to me, too. I love the, the phrase uh, that you seek an IV drip of comfort for eternity. <laughs> That's exactly what I want. That's exactly <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Such a great That's, visualization, yeah. <laughs> That's what I want. Uh, but I, what I resonated with was with sacrifice. Uh, mm. you know, we have to sacrifice if we want to know and be known and claim intimacy. Yes. With. And that relates with finances. It relates to relationships yeah. and everything. We have to be willing to sacrifice. And the one of the biggest things we have to sacrifice is comfort. That's right. Realize the goal is not comfort. It's growth. That's right. And growth comes from discomfort. discomfort. And so if you I, won't grow, then you really have discomfort. So it's it. you don't really get to get away from discomfort, but this, this gross discomfort is certainly the best place to be uncomfortable. Yeah, and I don't. I don't like that. No, I know. <laughs> Neither do I. It's much easier to teach it than to do it. I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, uh, but I think you, I think Jeff. that's huge. I hadn't considered that. Where it's like comfort is a given, or discomfort is a given. You know, yeah. you're going to be uncomfortable, and so you get to choose which way you're going to be discom uh, yeah. uncomfortable, or you're going to take what just naturally comes. And I, comes I, I hadn't considered that before. That totally yeah. makes sense. The other thing, just in reference to what Jeff was saying, a lot of times the lose yourself to find yourself scripture, right? A lot of times people have that is like, you know, just be a doormat and let everybody just take from you, which is not virtuous, but lose your ego to find your strength, right? That's what I see it as. Mm -hmm. Lose this control over how you're seen and your image so you can actually live truthfully and find real freedom. Mm -hmm. I love that. I like that. That's great. So mm -hmm. powerful. Well, mm -hmm. Jennifer, thank you so much for being on the fireside tonight and sharing your your perspective and expertise on on intimacy and and everything. There's on all three of you guys. I've been taking so many notes on on ways to improve my my love with myself and relationships that I have with other people. So thank you so much, all three of you, for being on the fireside tonight. This has been a fantastic hour that we've gotten to spend to spend with each other. Thank we'll you. finalize things with a closing prayer by Jeff. And then uh, just like we have in previous weeks, we'll hang out for another two or three minutes just to get to know each other a little bit better. And then we'll see you next week for another Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. Thanks again for joining us. And with that, we'll close things up with a closing prayer by Jeff. Our Father in heaven, we're very thankful for the messages that we have received tonight. Uh, in this digital fire sign. Uh, we pray that we might take what we've learned to strengthen the love that we have in our relationships. Uh, we pray that uh, we that our finances might bless our relationships. We pray that we might be wise in the use of devices. We pray that we might do those things that will help us claim intimacy in relationships and joy. Uh, we love thee very much. We're grateful for thy son, Jesus Christ, who sees us as we are and loves us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, I know uh, Jeff and Tammy, I know you guys have traveled a lot together. What, uh, and I think you, I think it was this year or was it last year that you, you spent a few months in Hawaii and, and what have been some of your favorite places that you guys have been able to adventure together? Oh, wow, that's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, to return, I would return to New Zealand. I love New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And and I love the Oregon coast. Uh, you know, when Tammy and I got married, we came home for, from our honeymoon to a house with nine children in it. 
and we haven't had hadn't had a chance to be alone. So a couple of years ago, we took six weeks off without the kids, and we went uh, from Santa Cruz, California, up to uh, Lake Quinault in Washington, and just had the time a time alone, and it was just a fantastic opportunity to be together and to know why we love each other and also to be very uncomfortable at times as we got to know each other better. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. Two, two of my favorite places right there. I, I love New Zealand. I, I would also go back there in a heartbeat and I've spent, uh, spent a lot of time in Oregon and Santa Cruz. And I was just a stone's throw away from where I grew up and everything. And cause I've got family that's in Oregon. And so, I can appreciate why you would love that that uh, that trip up there. It's it's just beautiful. It's beautiful up that way. What That's about you, awesome. Jennifer? Where have you traveled that you'd love? You oh, love New Zealand, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because my husband and I both work online uh, so much. We um, we were we took our kids out of school before COVID, and we traveled um, for many months. And we spent two months in New Zealand. And oh my gosh. We were kind of hoping we had gotten trapped there during COVID because that would have been my place I wanted to get trapped. I was like, where where would I have wanted to get stuck? That would be awesome. <laughs> Definitely New Zealand. It was just amazing. And um, so, yeah, it's just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I mean, I just, we kept sending pictures home and I think, they must think I'm faking it. Like, <laughs> it can't be that I'm seeing this many beautiful and varied things in such a small, you know, country. But totally. Yeah. Were you on the North Island or the South Island? Both. We spent a month on the North Island and a month on the South Island. Oh man, oh, how wonderful. So cool. Yeah, it was really That's great. Wonderful. That yeah. That's so cool. Did yeah. you guys did you guys go to Hobbiton? We did. <laughs> okay, we did. good. My kids absolutely loved that. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. That is yeah. so cool. I love that. Yeah, yeah that's it it was it, Every I've been to New Zealand twice, and and both times, just the pictures, the pictures don't do it justice for no, how don't. beautiful of a country it is. Yeah, it's amazing. And like so. stepping back in time, I just remember it was like you step back thirty years in yeah. time. It was just so quaint and charming and spark. Yeah. It was yeah. I remember we drove past a hotel that said they had three cable channels on the marquee. And it was like, <laughs> wow, that was, yeah. and that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is That's awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you all again for being on the fireside tonight. We'll let you get back with your families and, and everything. It's been a pleasure spending this time with you. And, and thank you all for your perspective on how to strengthen and strengthen love and relationships in, in, that we have. So thank you so much. And uh, for, to, to all of you who are watching and tuning in from wherever you are in the world, whether it's New Zealand to Nairobi to Utah, <laughs> thank you so much for watching tonight's Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Hey, if you like tonight's fireside, then be sure to check out this one on Nerd.